Thank you very much, Karen. Um, I am, I've been in medical device territory for almost 35 years. Uh, before that, briefly in pharmaceutical, I'm a physician and a pharmacist. And um, at this time, I'm also a member of the medical device coordination group, the MDCG in Europe. And I teach at uh, USC in Los Angeles, International Regulatory Affairs. So today, and oh, I, should, I almost forgot that, I'm the medical director of Emergo. And, and next year, I'm not sure that will be the same, but this year I'm still the medical director of Emergo. Um, the largest consultancy, regulatory and clinical consultancy in the world with subsidiaries in 27 countries. Um, and we do uh, from every regulatory thing feasible or thinkable for um, medical devices and IVDs. Good. So today I'm going to take you on a regulatory and clinical expedition in uncharted territory, as it says. Um, and to do that, I have to give you briefly my view of the pandemic of 2020. And most of it will be known to you so we can go through it quickly. We have an initial crisis leading to global panic and total and utter uncertainty about whether the hospitals would be overwhelmed and a gazillion death uh, would happen. And that was fueled by the infamous study from Oxford that predicted 2 million deaths in the US alone if nothing would be done. <clears throat> this led to an almost universal reflex of lockdowns and the uh, measures that we have seen. Uh, the clampdown on economic activities, I think, was not enough um, foreseen uh, in terms of consequences, and it led to an unprecedented economic crisis, which probably will have long lasting effects. So then the governments almost changed tack by saying, well, we don't want to have it spread gradually. We want it to minimalize. And that's a very different approach, which has more consequences economically and also health wise. And you just have to think about the mental health consequences, which are starting to show in the US. Uh, COVID here is, is here to stay with us and we better should adapt to the new reality. Why this great panic? If you look at the facts, it's not, and I've listed them here. Uh, it's really not very much justified in my opinion. So if we take minimally invasive measures uh, as listed under bullet four, they will greatly reduce the risk. And it has been said many times to mask in confined spaces, no mass meetings, self-containment in case of suspect symptoms. And <clears throat> if you met someone that might have been infected, then the measures uh, are well known what you have to do. In my view, no major intervention by government is any more needed. We have seen in Orange County that the hospitals never have fl uh, been flooded with too many patients that couldn't be handled. I'm not saying this is an innocuous disease, but certainly in our area, it wasn't as bad as uh, we suspected initially. Impacts. The globalization has at least temporarily reversed and national interests uh, are, have been put on the first, oh, what's that? Uh, in the first place, with impact on supply lines and in, in international travel and other things that we all are familiar with by now. Uh, I think that the remedial action by the governments worldwide will not ultimately offer enough remedy 
we need to reopen the economy in a sensible way. I do not think there will be a vaccine available before the second quarter 2020, uh, despite what everyone is saying, there may be uh, remedies before that's different from a vaccine. Uh, remedies are there, there are several remedies right now and there are good um, remedial actions for patients that have been fallen ill or that have uh, are posing a, a, a higher risk than average. So we also will see in my mind a competition for the vaccine and less international collaboration in this case. We'll, it will roll out over the next few months, so we'll know. We'll know. <clears throat> there are far fewer elective procedures, that's a fact. So there have been less consumptions of devices, except for the ICU and sterility related products. And that means that there are products now on the shelves that will probably not be used before they expire. Uh, what to do with these expired devices is um, a matter of the manufacturer, whether they can be re-sterilized or the sterility can be guaranteed, the shelf life can be ex extended, which is not such a um, far out concept that remains to be cleared with the FDA and with the notified bodies. But I do think there is uh, there shouldn't be any need for most products to be destroyed. We've seen that sales of many manufacturers have gone down, but not of all. And the rest you can read for yourself. Uh, the next to bottom bullet, I want to uh, attract your attention to that one, focus your attention on that one. In the early stage approval process, where meetings are with the FDA and with notified bodies are important, the lack of meeting opportunities has led to significant delays. And I do not think that those delays <coughs> eventually will be cleared because certainly the notified bodies, but to a lesser degree, the FDA has really been overwhelmed and they're working very hard to get rid of the backlog, but whether that will happen this year is far from certain. And then of course, we have a major impact on most clinical studies and we'll look at that in a moment. There are also positive effects. You can read the bullets for yourself. An interesting point I think is the third one. Uh, the NF, there are a number of ineffective products that have been placed on the market. In the, in the scramble for um, masks, and diagnostics, and other treatments. So once the bona fide ones have been approved, will those products be actively removed or will they just be left untouched? Um, and I haven't heard uh, either the FDA or competent authorities very clearly talking about that. In Europe, a positive effect, I would say, is the formal postponement of the date of application of the MDR. We'll talk about that. And in my mind, it might, there is not a total zero chance that it will be postponed again, although formal moves have not been started. And we are still seven months away from the DOA on the May the 26th of 2021. So far, no major delays in 510k reviews and de novo reviews, which is logical because these reviews are done remotely largely, but appointments, as I've said, are much harder to get. So what are the opportunities in Europe? Uh, costs are triggered by the postponement of the MDR. First of all, member states may place a non-CME marked product on their, marked, their market only. So in other words, if you have a great idea and you say this could help against COVID, but we don't have time to properly CE mark it, we do have an ISO 13485. Could we please place it on the market in Germany? 
the German beef farm might say yes, they might, uh, but that doesn't mean that the Dutch or the French or the Bulgarians also will say yes. It needs to be applied country by country. The commission has issued some guidance now for the extension of the validity of the MDD or AIMD certificates, but you still will have to speak with the notified body how they apply that guidance. And this could make a difference uh, between the notified bodies, although that's not intentional, but it is reality. <clears throat> so uh, that's the next point. And then the, for class one MDD certificates that are valid, were valid or are going to be valid on May the 26th, 2021, they will be valid for the next three years after that. Very important to realize, however, that the requirements for post-market surveillance, vigilance, economic operators, um, person responsible for regulatory compliance and so forth and so on, they will become valid starting May 26th, 2021. So as uh, Karen said before, if there are urgent questions, I'm not sure I can see those, but, and how I would see those, I'm in that sense, a computer, not a computer geek, but otherwise I will get, to get them at the end of this presentations. I'll make sure I look out for you, Yap, if there's any questions coming in. Good, fine. So opportunities in Europe uh, that are triggered by the MDR continued. Um, this, the first one speaks for itself. They may be made available up to May the 26th, 2025. Very important to talk with your notified body if your particular situation is not clear. Um, the commission gives itself one more year to designate new notified bodies under the MDR. We badly need those, especially for the in vitro diagnostics. There are currently only four of those. And I think we're heading for disaster if that doesn't improve. There are special extensions for bringing the UDI in conformity with the MDR. And that I, do, I think since most companies do have done it for the uh, uh, for the U.S. anyway. That doesn't pose a big problem. So the question is, will this be enough? And I have listed here a long list why it might not be enough. The big, the most important one are the the top three. No, I shouldn't say that. Top four. Udamed. Udamed is a core the database for medical devices clinical studies, um, notified body registrations, and so forth and so on, is not nearly ready. What particularly is not, not ready, and I've asked that um, directly to uh, a person who should know because he is in the Udemet steering committee, I said, what about that famous single registration number, the NSR, and which is absolutely essential to get into Udamed. And he said, maybe it's ready in two months and maybe not. Um, so we don't know. And also I think once it is ready and you have to apply for the SRN in the jurisdiction of the country where either your authorized representative is based or your company is based, there will be, the competent authorities will be totally overwhelmed. So I'm not sure how much uh, more time, there's only four months, five months between the new year and the, the projected start of Udamed. So I don't know whether that's going to work out. We'll see. Then the Mediterranean countries have been very hard hit by COVID. They lost basically four to six months um, altogether. And I don't think they will be ready in time. Uh, particularly Spain, I don't see how they're going to be ready to receive SRN uh, applications. And if they do not, 
and you have an AR in Spain, you're stuck. UK and Brexit impact, we probably all have seen the great document that was released by the MHRA a week ago. And it was one of the worst documents I've ever seen issued by the MHRA. The challenge is enormous to bring all the parts of the UK under one schedule, but Northern Ireland, as we know, has a particular complicated position in the uh, in the agreement with uh, with the EU. So I don't know how that's going to work out. Uh, I have no idea. I do know that all companies will need a UK rep, as it is called, an authorized representative in the UK. But I don't know. I asked that question to the MHRA actually, how ongoing clinical trials, for instance, would be affected. And we'll see, we hopefully will get an answer about that before the 1st of January. Notified body still overburdened. I don't think that will change anytime soon. Uh, because of the high demand and the low supply, the prices are going through the roof. And MDCG is a guidance and the commission itself says it's work in progress. But this is one of the things you can do and in fact must do if you work in Europe. You have to go to the uh, MDCG website and look at the current status of the MDCG guidances. And there are new ones coming out literally every month, sometimes a couple of them per month. There are very few common specifications. An exception, for instance, are the devices uh, under NX16, the devices without clinical benefit, as they are literally called. And that common specification is very badly written. Uh, so I think there a lot of work will have to be done over the next years. We've seen it with IVDs in Europe takes a long time to write those common specifications. Industry can play a big role, especially if you have a specialized device, you can play an outsized role in the definition of them, just like you would do in the US with a guidance document for a device class that is relatively rare. Uh, MDCGs have not been issued for most of the task. We see, we'll see. Uh, the creation of MDC guidance, oddly enough, is not impacted by COVID because it has been done remotely uh, last year and that hasn't changed. So uh, there's actually not a lot of delay caused by COVID. What can you do to help your company if you wish to go to Europe? We've seen the date of application has been moved to May. Uh, products with an existing valid CE marking under the MD they can continue to sell under the regime under one, um, one more year, but you have to talk, as I've said before, to your notified body. The other conditions, no major change to the design, continue to, to apply because then you lose that opportunity and come automatically under the MDR. Emergency use of expired or non c marked uh, products is a national matter. If you want to do that, you have to speak to the particular competent authority in any country. We can help you with that. We, we have not had that many requests, but as time moves on and products may uh, lie on shelves unused, that demand probably is going to increase and we have to see uh, what, what the requirements for data by the manufacturer for an extension of the shelf life are going to be. So the new designs, new products are new indications. I can tell you by now, notified bodies have become extremely reticent to allow that. And it, it really requires a very strong argument for the notified body to say, okay, let's do it under the MDD. And with, within the next few months, that opportunity is going to disappear completely. 
Uh, it's very interesting. MDCG, like the FDA, issued a guidance document that deals with notified body audits and travel restrictions. Uh, we'll see how that moves on as time goes on. That will increase to be a problem because if you have a recertification audit or an audit for a new product that arguably cannot be done completely remotely. So I don't know how they are going to resolve that. So this is just a reminder of what has not changed in the EU with the postponement and under COVID. And you can read those for yourself. The third one is very, very important. And since I'm told that a lot of companies in the audience are startups, there's a good chance that you have a novel or innovative product. Never say that, and I mean literally never say that to any regulatory agency. Tune down your product and say, well, you know, it's an improvement for sure. And we improved it over the existing product a little bit here, a little bit there, but don't say my product is the best in the world. It's innovative, it's novel. Nothing has been seen like that because if that is, that's what you say, then you're going to confront the highest regulatory scrutiny that is imaginable. So there's a huge gap here between what your marketing and sales guys will want you to say and what you as regulatory specialists are going to say <coughs> to the um, competent authorities or to the FDA. There will be increased requirements, requirements for pre and post CE marking clinical evidence. FDA has started a program with real time ev clinical evidence. Uh, so the two go hand in hand to some degree. Well, what can we do? The lack of, yeah, we've talked about that. There is a, one aspect where I'm not good. I have very little knowledge. I know that it is dealt with by country that's pricing and reimbursement. I know that Germany has Krankenkassen and that the system in Holland is different from that in France and the mutualité in Belgium and so forth and so on. But this is a company that I've worked with and they know their stuff with regard to uh, reimbursement, pricing and out-of-pocket out of payment both in Europe and by the way, in the US, which is much easier in a sense because it's monolithic. Once you're done with CMS here, you're done largely. Um, but in Europe, it is goes by country. Uh, so I would recommend that if you need this support, you call Arishent under this number locally. Then we've spoken, we've seen, um, the emphasis on post-market clinical evidence activities that have listed, been listed here. It's uh, some of these have been covered by MDCG guidance. And I would urge you, and it's the second time that I do that, I may continue to do it. Look at those guidances because your notified body is going to use them. They have to use them because there is no experience many times <clears throat> or very little experience. And these products that they're confronted with are increasingly sophisticated. You as the audience probably have sophisticated products. So it's very important that you read those. And if you have questions about the content, come back to me or you can obviously go to someone else if you wish. Um, but it is not a good idea to let it go and wait until you uh, get a lot of non-compliant observations. Um, by the way, the summary of safety and clinical performance, the format is quite different from what we know uh, uh, here in the US as <laughs> summary of safety and effectiveness. That, if you have seen the uh, several of uh, examples and you look at the guidance, 
the, the biggest difference is that the European guidance expects you to have language that's understandable for professionals, but at the same time also is updated and is understandable, is legible for lay for the for the user, for the layman user. So I don't know how that's going to work out. The notified body has to review it. And there is very, very little, if any, um, very precedent for this document. Well, I've listed here some, um, the most important one by far is the bottom one. Go to that side website every two weeks. And I mean that literally, go to that website every two weeks and see what's new. Um, this is dated April. There are, ish, there are new MDCGs that came out May, June, July, and August. And you don't want to miss a single one because if you do, that could be a major regret when you confront the notified body. So how, it, how to use this extension? Um, beware of the limited notified body resource. If you want to do something under the MDD, I think it's about either two minutes to 12 or two minutes past 12. Um, if you already started the process, get that MDD certificate as soon as possible, because if you don't, you may be too late. The study, I think, is not as critical, the third point, um, but you have to go to both the notified body and the competent authority and say, we have this COVID problem and this is the proposed solution, do you agree? We will get back to that. Make sure you all have the PMS and PMCF docs in a Germanic role. Germanic, you know, understand what I mean, in a real row. Uh, like, like you go to Disneyland, you're being pushed into the row. That's the, how precise and how sequential you want to do it. Okay, you can also say, this is not gonna work for me. Uh, let's go to the MDR and that gives you a good timing to talk with the notified body about what needs to be done. And again, we can help you there too, if you need. US, we are all familiar with the FDA emergency use authorization. I think that has is decreasing now rapidly because a lot of bad actors also have gotten in there. Um, you can you can read this um, in the link, and they also have a link to the 2017s for emergency use authorizations. Well, this speaks for itself. You can read it for yourself. All face-to-face -face inspections by the FDA were suspended. And I have not heard whether they have picked up that schedule. I, I think with the current situation, uh, still very unstable and uncertain, that may not have happened. And I don't know how they're going to get rid of that backlog at all. Uh, the, it's interesting, Commissioner Gottlieb left the FDA about one and a half year ago. He was very pro-industry and a very, very strong innovative force and everyone regretted that he left. Um, there's lots of speculations why he left, but if you read the Wall Street Journal, the editorials, he is regularly there with his opinion about what should be done about COVID and about new products. So uh, that's uh, available. So clinical studies have are heavily impacted. And we get to that momentarily. So delayed submissions are likely. And I want to go in some detail with you through this slide because it's so important. From mid-February 2020 through mid-May, there were no IRB approvals, no pre-FDA, pre-submission meetings, no IDE review completed, et cetera, et cetera. And similarly in Europe, there were no medical ethical committee meetings and approvals 
and so forth and so on. There was nothing happened. Everything was froze. Equally important, patient recruitment froze because patients couldn't come to the outpatient clinic or to the hospitals. There were no on-site visits and the remote monitoring that, that we will talk about was possible only in selected cases. So we saw an extra proportional effect in many non-US and non-EU countries. Those were almost completely shut down. FDA came out with a guidance. What do you do if your protocol was violated, but not voluntarily, involuntarily? Um, they gave a pretty good guidance about that. I don't know whether at this time in history they will still stick to everything of it. And if you were affected, I would not discard. That's the last thing I want, I would do. Do not discard your study because you're throwing out the window a lot of money. And in addition, even if patient efficacy data were invalid, the safety data that were collected in your study must always be included. So that goes even for a disqualified patient, patients that couldn't make their follow-up visits for a number of months and therefore had to be excluded from the, from the study. The safety data are still um, valid and must be used. So there is no clear guidance. I don't think there will be any clear guidance how to unfreeze the studies. Um, we see in Europe um, very slowly studies starting again. Some patients that have to go to the doctor, a good example in case they are dentists. You don't go to the dentist because you love to go to the dentist. It's really not elective a dentist visit. You go because you have to. So dental trials actually are moving on Nicely, remote uh, studies that, for instance, deal with virtual reality products or that are data heavy, but the data are entered remotely into a database are doing reasonably well. The accrual is very slow, but the data are still there and may be uh, elected, may be uh, entered if they can be captured remotely. So the bottom is, of course, devastating. If you have a randomized schedule and a blinded study, that may really upset the apple cart. And that calls for a um, discussion with, uh, between the sponsor and the regulatory authority. So if possible, do a moratorium say stop, we cannot continue, but the patients, especially for implants, that's a good option because the implant is there, it doesn't walk away. Uh, it may not be, you may not be able to collect data for four or six months, but the implant will still be there and you will be able to continue the study. And if the study was planned for one year, now you will have to probably to do it for one and a half years. So it's, it's a delay, it's a cost, but it doesn't mean that the study goes out of the window. Sometimes re remote electronic admission to the study is possible, depends on the product, depends on the study. Uh, obviously machine derived data are less impacted than implants. If you have a an fluoroscopy device and you measure the radiation, Fluoroscopy patients always will be there because it's usually not elective and you can still gather the data. It, it's all will be more complicated, but it can be done. On-site visits, there are a couple of on-site visits that cannot be avoided. And that's an initiation visit and a closing visit. So the if the initiation visit didn't take place, that means a delay for the study. If the closing visit didn't take place, the study still cannot be closed. In between monitoring is important, but that if that couldn't be done, it will 
put a lot of weight on the closing visit because now a lot more will have to be done and verified than otherwise would have been the case. And many of these studies, I think, will be have to be subjected to GCP and ISO 14155 compliance audits. So the top one is really important and I almost implore you, don't say this study is gone, we can't do anything uh, with it anymore. It's many times it's possible to find a solution, especially in these times where competent authorities are willing with a product that they wish to have, they wish to see on the market, they will probably um, negotiate a solution. So maybe I, I give you the idea of a 14155 snapshot audit. So that's not a full audit, but just see whether the major things like um, patient informed consent, data transfer, uh, et cetera, whether they, those still work if uh, you restart a dormant study. So, in case of doubt, source it out. Here I do a little bit of commercial. And that was my presentation. So I hope you have many questions for me. Thank you, Yap. Um, yeah, we do have some questions. Um, folks in the audience, if you have any questions, please put them in the chat box of the Q&A. Love to um, get those models for you. Can I open that over or do you, do you read it for me? I don't know how to. Yeah, I could do both. You can open it up as well. Um, Where do I open it up? <laughs> um, I'll, yeah, I'll take care of you, no worries. Good. Uh, there's one question that came in. As COVID will be with us for a little while, how do you see the use of remote monitoring evolve? Well, that depends on the study. If you have a data intensive study at a hospital site, then they you can do remote monitoring if you set that up. Uh, whether you go have to go on site or not is not always self-evident, but there are systems now that will allow remote monitoring in a um, FDA GCP compliant way. So it can be done. Um, but some on-site monitoring is inevitable, as I have said, the initiation and the closing visits to verify the compliance with GCP and ISO 14155. Great. Second question. Do you think that Europe will be ready by May 2021 or will some aspects functions and others not? And then there's a second piece. How does that affect CE marking? Well, I have said before that I do think that there is an odd chance that Europe will be ready. Northern Europe will be more ready than Southern Europe. And um, we don't know. We, I haven't seen any data telling anyone, industry or otherwise, the level of readiness of the respective countries. And I don't think the European Commission will tolerate a situation where they say, well, Spain cannot open, but Germany can open. I mean, that's politically very hard to sell. And also, I, do, I don't know how that would, would work with Udamed and the other tools that they have. So we'll see. We'll probably by January, February know how that uh, works. And that's specifically important for the, as I've said, the single registration number. Um, whether there will be another postponement, I don't know. I think that the, the commission will not uh, wish to do that at all. So they will avoid it like the plague. Now, another question that's coming through is what is FDA's attitude towards rescuing an ongoing study from being voided because of involuntary protocol violations due to COVID? Yeah, well, that's a difficult one, obviously, and needs to be um, discussed with FDA. There, there are several ways to do that. You can literally, as a small company, literally call up DICE, the Division for Small 
for industry and consumer education. That's the abbreviation. But it was it used to be known as the division for small manufacturers. You literally call them up and say, this is the problem I have. And they will tell you, well, you know, we'll arrange a meeting for you or you will be called back and then you can discuss it in more detail, which is really nice. You cannot do that in Europe, but you can do it in with the FDA. And <coughs> in addition, they have their guidance. So that starts with that. You should first have the guidance and then uh, the uh, it's, um, yeah, if, you, if that doesn't help you enough, you call DICE. Gotcha. Now, um, I know you spoke a little bit about reimbursement, and I, I know that's a hot topic. <laughs> it is. Very important. Um, anything else you can add for our attendees here? Um, yeah, I, I mean, I, I can add a lot, but it may not make a lot of sense, but that's, that's, that's fine. Um, the uh, uh, reimbursement and pricing are very inter intricate parts of the whole developmental per process. So in other words, let's say you can, you do a, cl a clinical study. The clinical study can say, or have a non-inferiority goal. So you say, my product is not worse than the existing products. Well, that's great. That's not going to give you a higher price. Obviously, because you're as good as you're not worse, beautiful. But why would I choose your product over another product? That's not clear. So you can build in certain features in the clinical to demonstrate that your product has these special features. Um, let's say we uh, can remotely monitor blood pressure. Well, that, that does everything, every body does that these days, but let's say you, uh, your liver functions remotely, you're, you're a heavy drinker and now you need to re remotely monitor your liver functions. That's um, a possibility and that's new and maybe no, no other uh, kind of product can do that. Um, or you can have a stent that is easier to Im be implanted than competing companies you have to build that in your study. So then it, then it becomes a superiority study, which is much harder and may take a longer follow-up and a bigger cohort, patient cohort, sample size. In that case, once you have done that, your reimbursement price might be different, might be. So there is a lot to talk about that, but the strategy, there's a whole strategy to achieve this. And that's where um, this company that I mentioned comes in and they will say, well, it's easier for you to go to country A and it will not be easy to go to country B because they have a certain attitude towards this kind of product. That's the kind of thing you need to know, a global strategy. Great. Um, we have a question coming in um, in regards to what is your position in terms of clinical trials for COVID? How are they trending? And do you feel the results are promising? I do not have enough knowledge about the clinical trials for COVID. I, if, if, if the question pertains to vaccines, um, let me give you my very, very personal opinion, um, which can be, of, of course, maybe, might be shot down in 30 seconds by, Fauci, by Dr. Fauci. Um, I do not think we will have one vaccine that will cover all the COVID varieties and strains, just in as much we do not have a single flu vaccine that does that. But it may mitigate COVID enough to make it a let's say a bad flu, but no, no worse. We have measles, we have measles vaccine and nobody is really asking, does it help against any strain of measles? We just take it, we take the shingles vaccine, we're happy with all of that. So the, the trials, these trials will result more in a safety data. So in other words, 
they can be relied on not to give you bad side effects than on effectiveness, which is best in any case uh, around 70%. It's not 100% in any case. So I don't know. I'm, I'm, I would really be a uh, looking into the, be able to look into the future to give you a more detailed answer, but I do not think that these studies will be done before the end of the year or even quarter one, and then they will be produced. The vaccines need to be produced. They need to be distributed. They will be distributed in a controlled version, fashion, sorry, to first responders, to people in the nursing homes, et cetera. So I think that's it. Yeah, can you tell us a little bit about Emergo? Do you, you talked about you know your experience in Europe and the US. Mm -hmm. Uh, do you also cover Southeast Asia, Australia? Absolutely. We have a, a small but very strong unit. I, I can say that really, because I worked with them the other day. A very strong unit in Australia. Australia is a very interesting country because they are very, very innovative friendly. Um, the lar a large part of the world studies for new products are done in the UK and in Australia because their agencies have a positive attitude about uh, feasibility studies. And we have a good um, small but very strong unit, as I said, uh, in Australia. Southeast Asia, yes, uh, India, China, Japan, I'm trying to forget not something. Um, 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 uh, Malaysia, Malaysia, absolutely, and Singapore. Awesome. We have a question coming in. Will Udamed need to be uh, operational in order for MDR to be deployed? No. <laughs> the, the answer is no. And everyone would love the answer to be yes. But the, 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 the matter is that MDR will be suboptimal because all the goodies that come with it, like a much easier uh, adverse event reporting, clinical study um, notification, uh, the governments being able to say, hey, this guy got turned down in Germany and now he is trying it in Bulgaria, that's no longer possible. So that is not going to happen. Um, and that has a consequence. I will talk about the consequence in a second. I forgot actually about that, but that's pretty new information. Without Udamed, all the other clauses about clinicals, about post-marketing, about the requirements for notified body, they're all valid. But what notified bodies will have to do once uh, the Udamed starts up is they will, they, the notified body, will have to enter the products under the MD with the MDD certificates. So that means there is not a single registration number on the MDD certificate. And for them, it's really bad because now, let's say it happens in May or in September next year, who knows, Udamed gets active, they will have to re-enter all these certificates this time with an SRN. So that's not good news for them. And if you are in that situation, and most of us are, it would be good to talk to your, both your notified body and your authorized representative, which we also do. By the way, that's one of our strengths in all the countries that, that we're based in. Um, how to do this? How, how logistically to do that? And I cannot tell you because no guidance has been or instructions have been given out, but authorized representatives will be amongst the first to know because they will have a big workload and you don't want your company to be the last in line and neither does anyone else. That's the problem. 